Hey guys, uh, I'm happy to introduce today uh, Shannon, beautiful woman and amazing coach and uh, health specialist who provide us a, a great opportunity to talk about uh, health in general, heart attack and all things re related to this. Um, Shannon, thank you uh, for, for this and uh, feel free to introduce yourself if I miss some uh, something. Yeah, that yeah. our audience uh, understand. Just for the context, uh, we are nonprofit, and our purpose and goal to decrease mortality rate from heart attack. And uh, we are volunteers of engineers, and we are sharing this video with the businesses, with people, with everyone who will be interested in decreasing heart attack risk. For. Yeah, Shannon, please go ahead, introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to do this. This is great. I'm really excited to share what I've experienced and what I've been working with over the last several years. Um, so I'm actually a cardiac ICU nurse. Um, been in nursing for 15 years and about five or six years ago, started really looking more into preventative and wellness side of, of healthcare. And Wow, the things I've learned over the last couple of years has been pretty fascinating. And so I kind of switched my career to be more on the functional, integrative, preventative side of medicine. I mean, I still get in there and get in the critical care scene, but definitely started realizing the gaps between health and illness that we have in our current healthcare system and started doing more on the health coaching side and getting more, you know, healthy preventative measures into private practices with doctor's offices and just kind of working more on prevention and keeping heart disease away versus having to come and deal with it in my ICU when it's kind of too late. So it's been a, it's been an incredible journey, but yeah, I definitely have had a lot to learn from the whole process. Yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction and let's deep dive to your uh, skills and uh, your professional growth. And you mentioned about uh, your cardiology and medicine area, but uh, uh, how did you choose the medicine area? It was the dream of the small girl or it was, I don't know, a family story. Could you share uh, this aspect? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. There's nobody in the in my family that's medicine. So it didn't, it didn't come up like growing up that way. But I always was fascinated by like those rescue 911 shows or something, you know, way before they have all this reality TV. I thought that was fascinating. And then when I got to high school and took anatomy and physiology, I was just fascinated. I was like, wow, the human body is so complex, but it works so well together. It was just very interesting. And then um, how I specifically got into the cardiology piece of it was once I kind of realized I wanted to go into the medical field, I got um, the opportunity to volunteer at the hospital and went around to the different floors, you know, kind of being the person filling the water pictures or whatever. Um, and then got hired on as a nursing assistant actually onto a cardiology floor. And so this was like at 16, 17, 18 years old that I'm working on this uh, cardiac floor. Not really sure what I wanted to do. Actually even said, I don't want to be a nurse. <laughs> Jokes on me because here I am. Um, but definitely was watching how everything was working. And I was just so fascinated by cardiology and the heart and how it works. And it's how it's such a simple system, but it's so important to the human body. I mean, it's basically plumbing and electricity, but if either one of those systems are not functioning properly, we have a lot of other issues. And so it's, it's very fascinating to be in cardiology. It's always been my, my passion within medicine. And so I just kept going up the steps, becoming an RN, working on a cardiology floor, then eventually working in the cardiac ICU. So when I um, got out of healthcare on the, on the critical setting so much and went more into preventative, it started out as wanting to help people with their heart disease and help them relate to how to have prevention for that or manage what the heart disease they already had. Uh, it was just a natural niche for me, but what I kept expanding from that, because I realized people don't necessarily care about the heart and heart disease like I do. <laughs> a lot of heart disease is very asymptomatic and people don't realize they have a problem until they have a problem. Um, so they don't care about it as much, but they care about, you know, things like how their body feels, how their body looks, you know, so I had to kind of start almost unofficially becoming a weight loss coach a little bit just to get them in to get concerned about their health. And then we could dive into the heart disease portion of it later. Once they had a better understanding of it. Cool, 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 cool. And uh, in other words, your story is uh, actually truthfully for the, from your passion and you volunteering and you touch this cardiology and heart area 
and uh, other aspects of uh, medicine. And uh, could you share your experience uh, in education system? I mean, uh, Greenville, Greenville uh, Technical College, uh, Institute of uh, Integrative Nutrition and Medical University of South Carolina. Right. In general, uh, what's your thoughts on education system, how it was, probably you have some and I know insights how to improve this system, medical system, and right. any, anything related to your education. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I wanted to go to the nursing schools that had the top board passing rate because it doesn't doing good to go to school all those years and not be able to pass the board. So that was definitely a priority. And I wanted to go to schools where you actually got into the clinical setting earlier on. Like a lot of schools, you'll do all the education and all the book work for years. And then finally, like maybe in your last year, you actually go into the hospital. And unfortunately, a lot of people get to that point and are like, I don't actually like this. So I liked, I wanted a program that got me in right away so I could see exactly what I would be getting into. Um, and then you know, I just kind of progressed from there. But what, I, what I've also realized with the medical system that we currently have is that, you know, our education system is great. Like we have so much research, we have so many great teachings, so many technology and advancements and just so much awesomeness that is coming out of our educational system for the medical field. And um, it's, it's brilliant what we've been able to do in a short period of time in medicine. However, I also feel that, you know, it's become highly influenced by the pharmaceutical companies and, you know, the way doctors have to practice in their practices is highly influenced by the insurance companies. And so we, we all know that those two, those two big guns are very influential in the med medical field. And for better or for worse, we definitely need drugs and medicine in healthcare. However, I think it's become such a focus that we've lost focus on actually the optimal, optimal way to run the body and how it works with the foods we eat and how it works with the movements we do and, and sleep. And we've gotten away from basics of how a human body works and very much got into, oh, here's your symptom. Here's a pill for you. Or here's your symptom. Here's a procedure for you. And so I think that's kind of a, a necessary overlook that we need to readdress with the educational system for medicine is that we're kind of losing that basic what needs what needs to happen to have health. It's kind of gotten away from healthcare and been more about a sick care illness, you know, treatment uh, system versus actually helping people stay healthy so they don't need so much of the system. Um, it's definitely a business, so I know they're running it that way, but it's it's an unfortunate that we have got the the ratios of sickness and illness that we do in in the United States considering that we do have the top educational systems in the country and in the world. Um, so there's a disconnect there, in my opinion. Yeah, I got it. In, in other words, uh, there are three um, interesting points. Point number one, that uh, all this industry, it's uh, more related to the functional medicine approach instead of uh, symptomatic when you close and fix one issue. Uh, instead of this, it will be nice to have a more functional approach in different area of the medicine. Secondary, uh, for sure, it's uh, area of the business and the good product is the product which provides the best value for the uh, patient. And sometimes uh, uh, th this value, which we uh, have right now, sometimes we discuss a little bit uh, about insurance and healthcare system uh, uh, a little bit later, but in general, your point that uh, it will be nice to maybe reorganize or adjust this uh, uh, from a, a functional point of view. Well, okay. and with that said, too, I would like to I also add that there are a lot of these schools that are kind of realizing this and they're adding in functional medicine institutes and they're adding in functional medicine programs or integrative health or I mean there's all these terms that we use to describe but it's basically just going back to looking at the root cause of the symptoms and diving into that area versus you know going to the end of the line and saying here's all the treatments you need for it um, but there are there is a lot of that starting to happen I mean this whole industry has been around for 20 30 years but it's just now kind of getting some some like recognition and, and people are starting to say, hey, wait a second, this is not working for me, all these pills. And so there is like the Cleveland Clinic, which is highly like one of the gold standards for healthcare, heart disease and, and you know, cardiovascular. They have their own institute now for functional medicine. And so it is starting to get there. It's been there, yeah. but it's starting to get the recognition now. 
Cool, 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 cool. This is a very good news. And uh, let's uh, back to your professional journey. And you mentioned that uh, sometimes people have a different expectation uh, after the university, medicine university, and when they started work in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And what was your first job and uh, how it was? And it, it, it was the hospital, right? And, yes. Uh, yeah, my first job working as an RN was on a cardiovascular floor in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And so I did that um, for a while and decided I wanted to become a travel nurse and explore other hospitals and other areas of the country. And so I did travel nursing as a cardiac nurse um, for several years and then found myself in the Bay Area of California um, at a really great hospital and then had the opportunity to um, work in cardiac rehab and do the whole rehab side of things. I got to work in a cardiovascular um, doctor's office on, with a bunch of um, cardiologists and then eventually found myself um, in the cardiac ICU for the hospital. And that's kind of where I've sat for the last decade um, other than when I go on the side and do all the functional medicine and preventative stuff. Um, so yeah, it was pretty interesting. It's all been cardiac. That's, that's definitely where my passion's at. Uh, and uh... In other words, you uh, work in hospital and you saw how the system works and how the mm -hmm. hospitals help to people with heart disease. And uh, after that, you uh, realize maybe some gap, right? And you uh, transform from the uh, one area to uh, this functional area, I mean, coaching and other things, right? Yeah. How was this transformation uh, from one area to another area? You know, I think it's it's actually a very common thing I feel with people in medicine and in the medical field. We're, we're trained one way until all of a sudden you're the person that has a problem. And some people just go to the doctor and say, okay, well, my cholesterol is high. I'm going to take a statin now. Or, you know, oh, it looks like I'm heading towards diabetes. I'm going to get on metformin. Whereas I'm more of the, wait a second, what is going on? So it actually stemmed from me having my own health issues. I started having cardiac arrhythmias. And, you know, then I had the, the best of the best cardiologists that I could go see and figure out what was going on. But it, it was interesting how I, I had these arrhythmias mostly when I exercised and the rest of the time I was pretty much okay. Or like if there was like a crazy code or something going on in the ICU, then maybe I'd have like these PVCs and stuff, these pre, these preventricular beats. And it was very interesting because it wasn't all the time. And so nobody was like, they're like, it's not a big deal. You're not having it that often. We could put you on an anti-arrhythmic. And I was already like, I don't want to be on drugs. There's, there's my body's trying to tell me something. There's a reason it's having these arrhythmia issues. Um, and so I started on this journey to just start doing my own research and start looking online. And then you start finding these articles that are more on the functional medicine side. And you're like, wait a second, that makes a lot more sense. Something's going on with the system as a whole versus it being just targeted to my heart. Um, something is setting the heart off. So let's figure out what that is so I can try and correct it. And for me, it was, I felt like I was healthy. I mean, I would work in the ICU, but my lifestyle outside the ICU was very active, but almost too active on that end. And so it was very much adrenaline junkie lifestyle, um, jump out of planes, dive in the ocean, you know, do those hardcore workouts. And so it was just too much adrenaline. And so I actually, by this point, I started looking into, started getting my coaching credentials and stuff. And then, um, was offered a job to go work at Google headquarters in Mountain View um, as their RN health coach. And I met a functional medicine doctor there who I said, let me just run my case past you and see, you know, what, what you think of it. Cause so far cardiology wants to put me on some, you know, anti-arrhythmics, the pulmonologist wants to check and see what's going on, you know, with pulmonary wise. Um, I've got the OBGYN saying, oh, it's probably, you need to be on birth control. I was like, I don't want all these pills and procedures. What do you think? And she just simply this like, like it was nothing said, oh, you probably got too high of cortisol. You have the cortisol cascade that then affects your other hormones, which then can lead to arrhythmia. And she just kind of laid it all out, basic anatomy and physiology of what was going on with my body or potentially what was going on. And she's like, we can do some tests and see exactly where your cortisol levels are and this and that. And that, and that ended up being the root cause of the arrhythmias. So it was needing to add a little bit more peace in my life, more yoga, meditation, and kind of having that balance from having the adrenaline junkie lifestyle of working in the ICU and having this, you know, the way I lived. 
And so what I thought was healthy was actually too much on one side. You know, you hear most about people, oh, I don't exercise. I don't eat well. Well, there's also the other extreme. And I was the example of the other extreme. And so I think a lot of medical professionals who start coming out of conventional medicine and going more into the preventative or functional medicine, it starts with their own journey of them saying, hey, what's going on with me? Cool, 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 cool. And you mentioned about Google. And uh, I know that uh, you had a chance to uh, collaborate with Google. Could you share for sure? Uh, there are everything on disclosure and right. other things. But uh, if it's possible, could you share your experience uh, coaching at Google and how it was? And what's Google interesting in terms of uh, functional medicine and about their employees? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, you know, I kind of feel when you, if you go to work at Google, you can either be really healthy or you can be really unhealthy because they have unlimited free food, but they also have unlimited free healthy food. So for me, I feel like I was probably the healthiest I ever ate because it was already prepared. I didn't have to meal prep. I just go down the cafeteria and it was available. But then on the flip side, there is also an unlimited amount of snacks and, and you know, things that aren't good for you. So you, you pick your battle, but it's, it's, Either way, it was convenient. So when people say, oh, healthy, eating healthy is expensive or it's inconvenient, well, that took that factor out. Um, so the employees there had the choice to do either or. And then, you know, they do offer a lot for their employees. They offer, you know, the, the exercise facilities, they have these nap pods, like they try to help, help people have a more balanced lifestyle. Um, but it, 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 there was a definite lack of education as far as how this human body worked within the engineers at Google. So it was pretty fascinating. I mean, it depended on the, which, which I had a lot of um, people that I worked with there and it depended on what their background for work was. If they were the engineers, no clue about how this worked. The computer, amazing, could tell you the inside and outs of it and everything that I had no clue about. The human body just didn't connect. So I had to figure out, okay, how can I relate what their world is to the world that I'm in and get them in a better health place? Um, because unfortunately, the, the sad part is a lot of their profiles, if you just put on paper where they're at with their health, you're looking at like the health of a 50 year old, but they're like 20, 25, 30 years old. Yeah. And you're like, this is not exactly. going to be good for you long term, right? You're sitting in front of a computer all day, you're not exercising, you're eating all the junk food, then you go home and play your video games. And so there was a lot of education piece that was needed, but I had to find a way to reach them and something that they cared about. And what I realized what they really cared about was their brains and their brain health. That was the big, you know, that's their thing. They're, they got their PhDs, their, their master's degrees, they're, they're all alpha, you know, as far as that goes. Um, mm -hmm. So they didn't really care like what they look like, oh, whatever, if I got a little weight on me, who cares, you know, but they, their brain health, when you started talking to them about what they're eating and how they're exercising and how that affected their brain health and how having bad cardiovascular issues affected the brain health, all of a sudden then the light bulbs went on and they're paying attention and wanted to actually do things and help be in a better health situation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh it's very interesting insights uh, from the Google and there are no too much company right now in the world who are following this approach, uh, but more and more company involved in this uh, simple uh, idea that you invest in your uh, uh, employers and uh, this much more better in strategic way, uh, in a long way uh, in the future for the company uh, instead of, you know, uh, handling the uh, stress, uh, heart attack risk or another uh, disability which could be the result of the sitting near the computer or laptop whatever age uh, yeah and uh, right now my question uh, especially for you and about you uh, when you become a founder uh, how how it was you know when you're a specialist it's a one story you have a bunch of responsibility and uh, right. you have a like I don't know uh, some 40 uh, hours a week and that's it right. and what what about but as for founder it's completely another story right and yeah could you definitely. share this experience and how it works for you personally right yeah i well you know i started out kind of just doing the health coaching role and was getting business mindset going because you know again they don't teach you business mindset in, in medicine or in, in nursing school and so it's kind of like self-education, self-teaching, taking different courses and stuff. And so after I um, left Google, I decided I wanted to start my own business. And I, and I founded U Heart Life, which was going to be my, my company for helping people 
take better care of their health and, and taking the knowledge that I know from medicine, but also applying it to how do I keep you from seeing me at my other job? I don't want to see you in the hospital. <laughs> and so it was very much, okay, let's get this going. And, you know, I called it you heart life because I mean, it really was about, it's about you. It's about the person. At the end of the day, I could teach them and educate them all day, but you are the one that's going to be making the choice. You're going to be putting the food in your mouth. You're going to get up and get off the couch. You're going to get proper sleep, you know? So that's why I kind of decided it was going to be about you, the other person. Um, and then heart because cardiovascular heart, you know, cardiac nurse, that just made sense. Yeah. And the reason why we do all this stuff is because I mean, it's really about our lives and, and the life that we have. And whether you want to travel the world and see things, you're going to need your health. If you want to be, you know, the master at this and, you know, really be successful at your business, you're going to need your health. If you want to raise children and have a family, you're going to need your health. And so you heart life kind of came out of that philosophy of the reason why we need to take care of ourselves is because we want to have a good life while we have life on this earth. And so, yeah, being the founder, it was a, it was a new world for me. I, I had to learn to be the marketing person and I had to be the salesperson and I had to be, you know, the one that goes and talks to the doctors and the front person and the educator. And, and so it was, it was interesting learning all those different roles. And yeah, when you have a typical job with nursing, you know, you do your three 12 hour shifts. When I worked at Google, you had your nine to five Monday through Friday. Now all of a sudden you're, you're a business owner and you're, you're the founder of your company and it's kind of 24 seven. And so, uh, unfortunately, you know, stuff started resurfacing again with my, my heart arrhythmias because now here I was again, in almost like another adrenaline junkie situation, 24 seven dealing with stuff, not yeah. sleeping properly. And so not trying to be a hypocritical person of what I was trying to teach all my other people, but I had to dial it back and say, yeah, having a business takes a lot of time and effort, but you're going to have to also, you know, practice what you preach. You can't just be business 24 seven helping everyone else. And I think medical professionals sometimes are the worst at taking care of their own health because they're so busy taking care of everybody else's health. And so if I could give any message out to my, my fellow medical professionals is you've got to take care of yourselves. And I know we have such passion and hearts for others, but it's got to be a balance. So yeah, it was, it was challenging. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this honest uh, thoughts uh, yeah. according to the uh, business and uh, your role as a founder. Okay, and uh, we uh, um, we changing our agenda and uh, try to talk about heart attack in more uh, details. And first uh, question, for sure, I uh, we all know traditional answer from traditional medicine, um, uh, but especially for you, uh, probably you have some, your own thoughts and your um, uh, ideas. Uh, why do so many people have problems with heart attack risk score? Heart attack, yeah. Oh, I so love many people, this is a top killer, <laughs> top killer yes. of, of, in the world, you know? Yes, yes, and that's, and that's, the, that's the real tragedy in it is that this is the number one killer However, 80% of it is lifestyle. I know people want to say, oh, well, my family has it, you know, heart disease runs in my family. And sometimes you want to look at them and say, nobody runs in your family. That's why you have heart disease. <laughs> nobody's exercising. Nobody's eating well. It's not that you have the disease necessarily passing down through the gener generations. It's that grandpa cooks and eats this way and lives this way. So pass it on to son who passes on to son. Um, but yeah, when, even if your 20% is not good and it's not, you don't, you didn't get the good gene pool, there's 80% that we're still in charge of that is basic lifestyle. And, you know, I, I, I saw a podcast the other day where they were talking about less than 3% of Americans actually can check yes to the four basic categories that prevent heart disease. And those are being not smoking, exercising 150 minutes a week, um, eating like a whole, you know, whole food kind of diet and being in the lower um, body fat percentage category. Less than 3% of Americans can say yes to that. And so with something that's 80% preventable, it's pretty sad that we are in this position. And so I think the big question of why is it this way is the actual thing is that we're not asking why. We're not asking, why do you have high cholesterol? Why do you have you know, obesity issues? Why do you have um, depression, anxiety? Like we're not asking the underlying root question of why is this happening? We just say, oh, that's happening. That's the symptom. Here's your pill. Here's your procedure. 
And that's the way we're managing it. And, and I think it's a very poor way to manage something that is so preventable. And yet it's the number one problem in, in healthcare. Yeah, you mentioned about this tough topic that uh, about statistics and about uh, on the small amount of percent who are uh, able to go through this checklist from the four points. Uh, but what's your thoughts on the problem in the United States, uh, especially for the United States, not the world, but specific of the United States? What do you think about um, heart attack problem? Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to having an understanding of exactly how heart disease works. I think we've been very much taught that it's because of high cholesterol. It's because of, you know, being overweight or whatever, but the underlying issue of most diseases is inflammation and heart disease is included in that as well. Um, however, for some reason, this information has been out for 20 something years, but it's not a popular topic of discussion because then you have doctors who are like, okay, well, if it's an inflammation issue, how do we deal with the inflammatory problem? looking for, you know, what's the anti-inflammatory pill or what's the procedure we can do. And there isn't one it's inflammation is caused by many, many issues. And I think in America, the typical American lifestyle is very pro-inflammatory. Um, we're, we're eating processed foods like crazy. I mean, it's about convenience and just, you know, people love their, their fast food. They, and even if you don't love fast food, what's in the grocery store, like 90% of what's in the grocery store is not even real food. It's all packaged products. And then, um, you know, the way we, we also get inflammation is through stress. We're one of the most stressed out nations with our competitive, you know, go, go, go personalities that we have in America um, and the competition and, and just the stress we put on ourselves. And then now the economy and people just trying to afford housing, but their, their cost of living is insane. And you get out of school and you're already this much in debt from your, just your schooling. So you're kind of starting out behind. So it's a very high stress society. Um, and so that's causing a lot of the inflammation issues. And then also people manage stress. Sometimes people stress eat. Sometimes people just want to lay in bed and, you know, binge on Netflix or drinking issues or go to drugs, you know, all these ways of managing stress that are also pro-inflammatory, pro-issue for heart disease and other diseases. Um, we have a big problem with loneliness and isolation, especially after the pandemic and having to be forced to be in these positions where we were trying to keep everyone safe and trying to deal with COVID, but then we isolated everyone. And now that now mental health issues are on the rise. And so I think the lifestyle that we have in America, it does not support healthy lifestyle for the whole and people are trying their best. And even when they think they're eating healthy, they come to look at the back of the package and they're like, I thought this was healthy and it's not. And so I think it's a many issues. It's, it's multifaceted. I think it's our, our food system needs an overhaul. I think our educational system needs an overhaul. Our, our medical system definitely needs an overhaul. And so these are the major components of what creates a community in a country. And it's, it's become a lot of business and, and, and go, go, go. And so unfortunately it's, it's caused a lot of, you know, issues. Yeah. And you mentioned that, um, uh, in America, we need uh, to change the medicine uh, system. We need to change uh, uh, the business, the education, and other topics. But you know, in, in this game, there is a one interesting um, uh, gamer, and the name of this gamer, insurance company. Yeah. And uh, what is the role of the insurance company in solving the heart attack problem on your, uh, from your personal? Well, I don't know how much interest they have in solving the, uh, the issue. I know they have a big interest in collecting money, but, um, you know, the, the insurance was originally supposed to be out there as a way to like protect us and, and give us a way that if you did get sick and it needed, you know, you weren't totally drowned by this financial burden, but I don't know what's happened over the last couple of years, but I think most people have come to realize that they're paying a ton of money for their insurance and they're not getting the, getting back the return. Um, and, and a lot of people's decisions on how they manage their health care is based on, can I afford it? There's so many diabetics who, who it's insane the amount it costs for them to have their diabetic medications and their insulin and, and, and the, you know, the things to check their sugars. Um, so then they, they go without, or they, they say, I don't need to check my sugar today. It costs too much. I'll, I'll do it every other day. And so they're not being able to manage very well these things. Um, of course, in my world, I would have a discussion about their diet and getting things back on track that way versus, you know, just fixing that with the pills. But yeah, the insurance company really does um, influence the cost of things. And if you go into the hospital, I mean, it doesn't make sense that 
you have to pay four dollars for one Tylenol pill versus you can buy a whole bottle on your own. So the influxuation of like prices in hospitals and then the hospitals being determined what the insurance will return. It's 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 kind of sad. And like working with a lot of the private practices, a lot of them are opting to go where they don't even accept insurance anymore. They're like, it's just we're gonna be a cash for service kind of practice because it's almost a secondary job for these doctors to have to battle the insurance companies to try and get them to cover basic tests. And, and it's really sad. And so doctors are like, it's not even worth it anymore. I, I mean, if you, I would love to help you, but I, I'm going to run my business into the ground, just fighting the insurance company. And so I think that's really a big miss, unfortunate. And, and the original purpose of what insurance companies were there for, I'm not so sure if that's still what they're being used for at this time. Yeah. I know that uh, some American successful American businessmen. Uh, it's very popular in this uh, area of the American businessmen go to the, you know, Canada for mm -hmm. surgery or to the another, in other countries. Because yeah. uh, at the end of the story, they pay less and they get the more quality uh, right. the, uh, of the uh, procedure. Well, when I worked down in um, San Diego, there's a lot of doctors that have actually moved over across the border. They've moved their practices into Mexico. They're American trained. They have all the training of American medicine, but they're like, I'm sick of the red tape. I'm sick of my hands being tied. I just want to help people. And they're able to offer their services for like half the price. And then you have a lot of patients who will go over the border to get their medications from Mexico because the same exact pills in America just going over the border, it costs way, way less. And so there's definitely a very big disconnect, but I think that the thought is, well, Americans will pay for it. So we'll charge them more or it's the business aspect of it. But yeah, there's definitely ways that it's being figured out in other countries. And then people are figuring out how to work the system in other countries because yeah, you can have an MRI in Mexico for a hundred bucks. You can have it in America for 1500, you know, people, yeah, people are going to make that choice. So yeah, finger crossed that uh, in, in this uh, field, everything will be fine. And actually, we are uh, close to the uh, end of our interview. Yeah. And right now will be one million question, uh, question for the one million dollars. If you will be, uh, I don't know, president of the world and you will have all financial education resources, um, you able to, I don't know, change uh, very fast, uh, low, laws and i don't know uh, econ economy in other words you have everything which you need top three things which you uh, will do for fixing heart attack problem what do you think oh that's a good one um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to think about how i want to answer this um yeah i mean i think in order to really focus in on how we're going to deal with heart disease i think we have to get back to looking at basic anatomy and physiology. We have to get back to the basics, like technology advanced, medicine advanced, the human body did not advance that much. It still requires the same amount of food, the same types of food, the same amount of activity, sleep, those things that we could just get that mindset back on track and then creating environments that makes that more successful. Like I know a lot of towns, they have tried to put in like walking trails and making more nature places to, for people to get from point A to point B. So it's not so much sitting in cars as much, making it more friendly for there to be activity, having places for people to go to feel active. Um, California is really good at that, but they have the perfect weather all the time. So it kind of makes it easier. I know in like winter time comes and half the United States has to shut down that whole piece because it's just freezing. Um, but there are other ways to do that. But getting that back on track and, and when you go to visit the doctor's office, that it's not so much of, okay, here's your pill, but it's like, okay, we're going to get you set up maybe with a, with a health coach or something to get you looking at your health and getting things back on track and making it more of a, a normal. I know we've got this whole thing now where it's, it's kind of, um, you know, we're saying don't fat shame people and, and, and don't talk to people about their health, but at a certain point there, yes, not everyone needs to be skinny. Not everyone has the same body type, but at a certain point it isn't reality. Like that is not healthy. That is disease waiting to happen. And in fact, it's already happening. The symptoms just haven't risen enough to be a concern and just kind of reframing and getting everyone back on track with this idea of health versus sickness and illness and pills and, and procedures. And I know that's an overhaul taking, but having limited resources and money, I think we can make it happen. <laughs> Starting with what we're teaching in the medicine schools, which then will go to the doctors who then teach the patients, you know? 
Okay, and uh, real time, and actually a last question, because uh, you are so uh, give a lot of uh, interesting information, which yeah. uh, our listeners, uh, I'm sure, will able to get and to adjust for their own uh, lifestyle. And uh, you touch a little bit uh, topic about technology. How does technology help to um, decrease heart attack risk or and or maybe increase? Uh, your thoughts on this? Um, we have a lot of great technology that we use to help discover heart disease. Like we have, you know, we have our stress tests that we do, and then we can do cardiac catheterizations and we do all these different testing with technology. I think that there's a piece that we're missing though, is that for example, like if someone comes in and we can do all kinds of blood work, we can see what exactly what's going on in your body in that snapshot when we take some blood and you typically go in, if you're checking for heart disease and we check cholesterol levels, we maybe check a glucose and A1C to see how your blood sugars are doing. Um, but we're still using this very basic cholesterol panel that just kind of tells you total cholesterol, your LDL, HDL and the, the LDL is even based off of a calculated number. And that's what doctors are making their decisions off of is this calculated number on kind of like this antiquated system. And, you know, there's also ways that we can look at the blood panel where it's like, okay, you have cholesterol, but is it good LDL or bad LDL? There's two different types, big particle, little particle, you know? And so we're not looking at the breakdown because you could have high LDL, but if it's not the bad LDL, you're okay. Um, we also, if it's an inflammatory process, we should be looking more at, you know, CRPs and inflammation. So we have the technology, we have the ways to look at stuff. I don't think we're using it exactly appropriately. Um, and I think figuring out ways to better look at the underlying root cause with that technology would be more helpful than some of the practices that we've had. Yeah, absolutely. Shannon, a uh, huge thing for all your insights, uh, during interview and for all your information for your encouraging yeah. i wish uh um, best of the best for your business that you have much more probably all people <laughs> following your approach and uh wish all the best for you and uh thank you so much and i'm sure uh we will have uh, more interviews in the future yeah thank you, Shana. i'm happy to help thank you so much for inviting me yeah thank you have a good day and okay. see you Bye. Bye.